Valentin, good afternoon. How are you doing? Hello, Peter. I'm fine with you. Thank you. Also fine. Saturday, eight days before your fourth recital. And today we are here, as promised, to record some insights about uh, Debussy, Claire de Lune. So uh, let's go straight into it, Debussy. So Debussy, as a person, can you upfront tell us a little bit about his life? Actually, must say, I don't know too much about him. You wouldn't necessarily think so from his music, but Debussy's life was actually quite unhappy. He was the oldest of five children and his parents could barely make ends meet. His mother also rejected him and it was an aunt who took pity on him and managed to get him some piano lessons. This turned out to be the making of him and he into developed into something of a child prodigy. He entered the Paris Conservatory as a piano student when he was just 10. Initially, he was quite successful, but he didn't like to study regularly and rigidly and eventually just remained as a composition student. Well, composition seems that was a, a good choice. So uh, what, what were his first steps and maybe successes as a composer? He managed to win the top prize, the top composition prize at the conservatory, the Paris Conservatory. Um, this was called the Rome Prize. And it meant he could go and live and study in Rome for a year. Unfortunately, he didn't enjoy his stay there. And I don't think he even learned Italian properly because at the beginning of Claire de Lune, there is a bit of an embarrassing mistake in his Italian. He writes that no pedal should be used when he clearly meant to use that he should use the pedal. Debussy was one of these young composers like Schubert and Schumann who liked poetry and started by writing songs and also piano music. He wrote two songs with the title Claire de Lune, but they're far less well known than this piano piece and they're also quite different. Okay, so Claire de Lune is part of the so-called Suite Bergamasque. Uh, I mean, Claire de Lune, I understand that's Moonlight, uh, but Bergamasque, I have no clue. What's that? Well, it's the Claire de Lune is the third movement from the so-called Suite Bergamasque. And it's a bit of a strange title, really. A Bergamasque is an 18th century village dance from the Bergamo region of northern Italy. You're quite close to Lake Garda there. Debussy's idea was to revive the French dance suite. It had been abandoned at the end of the Baroque era in the 18th century when the Italian style took over with sonatas, symphonies, concertos and so on. But Debussy wanted to revive this elegance of a bygone age together with its musical forms. But he did stay true to the musical language of his own day, which was late romantic. When you listen to Claire de Lune, you can hear Impressionism knocking at the door, but it hasn't quite arrived yet. Okay. So Claire de Lune, once more, it's a work with a title we already had in your other recitals. Of course, the Moonlight Sonata from Beethoven, the Raindrop Prelude, and the Pathetic from Beethoven. And then in all these previous cases, we learned that the composer didn't choose the title, and sometimes the title even came later. Ah, what, what's the story this time? Did Debussy name it like that? Yes, he did. Just for once, we have actually uh, uh, the, the correct title. But originally, he did call it Promenade Sentimental. But it is a bit of a, a, an odd title, so he changed it to Claire de Lune because promenade sentimental means sentimental walk. So whereas Claire de Lune means moonlight. 
I like the idea of a promenade, though, because the landscape in this piece is constantly changing. Now, Moonlight as a title does suggest the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven, and there are some intriguing similarities. I'll give you just two examples. Here's a little bit of the second movement of the Beethoven, which goes like that. And that's the opening of the Debussy. Again, in the Beethoven, you go like this to this, and then up here, and in the in the Debussy, you do. I think there's something there, and there's also later in the piece when you get to this beautiful middle section um, to this sound. Uh, the beginning of the Moonlight Sonata, at the beginning, Beethoven does this. Now, I think Debussy basically just changed it from minor to major and goes. sonority, I think he makes very clever use of it there. But the main influence on him in this piece, I think, is nevertheless Chopin. And when, if you think back to the raindrop prelude I played at the last concert, there are some interesting similarities. Now, again, the Chopin starts, the, the Debussy starts like this. So we're going from this a flat to this one and then to the F. Yeah, from the so these are our two main notes. Now, in the raindrop prelude, you go from the F down here. And in the left hand, there's some thirds as well. And so on. I think that's quite an intriguing connection. But even stronger is the connection to the first Chopin Nocturne. Now, if we just compare a couple of passages here, you can see there, uh, if you look at the music now on the screen, there's the beginning. Uh, well, this is actually from the middle section of Chopin's first Nocturne. And I'm just going to play to you those first seven bars of that. Here we go. there and even more intriguingly if you look back to the beginning of this example where you have this right hand here now Debussy turns just the other way around he starts if you like from the back of the bar so he goes later on in the in the Claire de Lune he does this Chopin without copying it, of course. Now, at the start of Claire de Lune, the rhythm and harmony is actually very subtle because he deliberately, he deliberately leaves out the downbeats and also keeps the harmony in suspension. So the first two notes you hear are not actually what we call on the beat. This is the first beat. This is the second beat. And only this is the third beat. And now we're back on the beat, but he keeps it deliberately vague so as to create this kind of romantic and intriguing atmosphere. And there's not much harmony yet. We haven't yet had that, that bass note here to give us a clear idea of where we are. So when he starts here, he 
it's not very mysterious. Again, the rhythm is a bit more vague because he goes from three beats on uh, th three notes on on each main beat to two notes and so on. Yeah, and then he gradually descends. journey B carries on and you reach an important point here finally we've reached our key of D flat major and that's basically the opening again but now with rich harmonies Not at all rigid, as you said, when he was a piano student. So, however, I mean, yes. there is a structure in it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit how uh, we can understand the building of the work? Yes, Let, let's uh, look at the different sections of the piece. So let's go through it. Of course, it is very much a sense of journey, but there is a, a quite a clear structure. After you hear that first opening there, he, you then come to a much darker section with chords. You can actually hear the moonlight on these chords. He's also marked this tempo rubato, so he wants the tempo to be flexible and, and again not rigid. Yeah. Um, now this these chords they grow gradually louder and louder and, and there's a bit of a bit of a climax um, here. And it comes down again and then we come to that beautiful middle section that we talked about earlier. wonderful climax at which point he then very cleverly brings back the thirds from the opening but they completely transform they go and everything calms down again and and it all peters out with some arpeggios now it's time to bring back the opening, but now remote up here, much higher, an octave higher. You can hear it, but it's more hidden away. And it's meant to be super quiet. He writes PPP, -P -P, which is triple pianissimo. So, so everything is, is is very, everything is transformed constantly, but there is a clear structure to the piece. And, and this uh, lovely theme from the middle section, that's also returning? No, he, he doesn't bring it back. He, he hints at it, but what he does is he leaves out the top line and he just brings you these the rolling, which he has actually done already when he brought those harmonies in when he returned to, to the theme here. These, these arpeggio from the, from the left hand actually form part of that middle theme. But at the end, he never actually brings the theme back, he just hints at it. And we can hear it with our inner ear. There's a bit of it, and then it disappears again. And we feel its presence still. just the peaceful arpeggios from that middle theme. And finish it all. In P 
pure moonlight, of course. Very nice. Also a little bit unfulfilled about that theme. Valentin, thank you so much for these insights. We are looking forward to hear Claire de Lune next Sunday. Thank you so much and have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.